Good afternoon, welcome back to Codex. Many, but not all of our talks this summer feature graduate students and postdocs who were nominated to speak by their senior colleagues. Today, we're very happy to have Matthias Wellershoff be the final speaker in this series for this summer. Matthias graduated from ETH Zurich in 2022, advised by uh, Rima Alafari, and he is currently a postdoc at the University of Maryland, working with Wojtek uh, Kaya, Chaya, excuse me. Uh, Matthias, uh, his research interests are in phase retrieval. In particular, he's interested in problems involving time frequency and time scale structured measurements. We're excited to have him here to tell us about uniqueness of phase retrieval from sampled Gabor measurements. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. And Thank all the organizers for having me here. It's uh, it's an honor to present at Codex. Um, as you already said, I'll, I'll be talking about phase retrieval from sampled Kabor measurements. And uh, before doing so, I quickly want to show you some applications. So I quickly want to show you why you could care about uh, phase retrieval from sampled Kabor measurements. Um, the first application I want to show you is X-ray diffraction imaging and the reason why I think that has to be the first application, because historically that is the first application in phase retrieval. So the picture you're looking at here is, um, is scattered X-ray intensity from a copper sulfate crystal. And maybe in more mathematical speak, what that is, is the magnitude of the Fourier transform of a 2D projection of an electron density. Okay. And I think so, I think, I mean, this is interesting to me for two reasons, essentially maybe more than two reasons, but two main reasons. The first one is um, this picture was taken in 1912. So that's more than a hundred years ago. And I think it neatly illustrates that phase retrieval has a very long history um, and a very interesting history as well, because um, this picture was taken by two lab assistants of Max von Laue, and he would later then win the Nobel Prize for these kind of pictures, for his uh, discovery of the diffraction of X-rays by crystals. So there's a uh, well, there is, let me tell you, there's actually more than one Nobel Prize that's associated to, um, to, to phase retrieval. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so maybe to make it, maybe this is obvious to everyone, maybe it is not. So how is phase retrieval related to this picture? Well, as I, as, I, as I told you, this is the magnitude of a Fourier transform. So if you want to recover the underlying signal, so the element of which we've taken the Fourier transform, we need to assign the phase to this magnitude before we can take the inverse Fourier transform. So that's how phase retrieval comes into the picture here. Now, for the purpose of this talk, um, this is maybe not the perfect application to look at. The application which fits the question that I'm interested in more precisely is audio processing. And for like to, to give an image of audio processing, what I what I present here is just a spectrogram of a digital audio recording. And that audio recording contains the voice of an alpine brown, which is a bird that exists in Switzerland, which is where I'm from. So that's why I use this specific example. And for those that don't know, a spectrogram is the magnitude of the short time Fourier transform. So if you want to take a picture like this and figure out what kind of uh, audio signal goes with this picture, you would have to do phase retrieval first to assign a face to every single pixel in this image. And then you could um, take the inverse short time Fourier transform in order to find a digital audio signal. Okay, now that of course is not directly an application that should interest you. I think an actual application that is, is being used is what we call the face vocoder, um, which is some form of digital audio processing in which you either time shift um, or, uh, sorry, time stretch or pitch shift an audio signal. So that's some kind of application here in audio processing. Now, from the point of mathematics, I hope that I can also convince you that phase retrieval is a highly interesting, uh, interesting topic just within the 15 minutes of this talk. But one thing that I want to say right now is that it's very noticeable if you do phase retrieval that there is many, I would say, deeply fundamental questions about phase retrieval that are open. And those questions include, include questions about uniqueness and stability of the problem. So maybe this is over the top, but 
slightly over the top speaking, <laughs> a good rule of thumb is if you have any question on phase retrieval, mathematically, it's probably still open. It's probably not answered. <laughs> so there's many interesting questions and some of them we want to start, or I want to start, um, give like a little bit of an answer to today. <laughs> okay. So that is the history and the applications. Now, let me show you the problem that we're looking at. So as I said in the title, um, we're looking at Gabor phase retrieval and Gabor phase retrieval involves the Gabor transform. The Gabor transform, you can see it here on the slide, that is a linear transform. And uh, so once we know, so once we have this definition, we can actually define Gabor phase retrieval as the problem of recovering a signal in a certain signal class X, is our signal class. Um, and we assume that this X is a subset of the square integral signals. And okay, so the problem now is recovering the signal from the magnitude of its Gabor transform on some subset omega of the time frequency plane. That is the phase retrieval problem. And um, so there is one famous abstraction to phase retrieval, which is known as the global phase ambiguity. The global phase ambiguity refers to something that I just want to explain quickly now. So if you take a certain signal f and you also consider e to the i alpha f, then you cannot distinguish between those two things from Gabor transform magnitudes because the Gabor transform is linear. And because, yeah, I mean, then the e to the i alpha just moves outside of the Gabor transform and then gets absorbed by the absolute value. So there is no difference between the magnitude measurements of f, oh sorry, of f and e to the i alpha f. And the way we work around this in the phase retrieval community is that we introduce an equivalence relation on L2. And just because I'm going to speaking, I'm not going to be writing today. What we say, the, the words we use is that we say f and g agree up to global phase if and only if there exists such an alpha such that f is e to the i alpha g and then we do Gabor phase retrieval up to global phase because that's really the only way we can hope for a positive uniqueness result and also because in applications losing a global phase factor is often not so bad okay so now we know what the problem is i think a good next step is to um uh well, to learn a little bit about classical uh, uniqueness results. And the, the famous classical uniqueness result for phase retrieval in general uh, is um, connected to this complement property, which was suggested by Balan Kazatza in 2006. And actually what, what, what you can show is that this complement property without telling me what it is right now is necessary for Gabor phase retrieval. Now, importantly, it is necessary, but it's not sufficient for Gabor phase retrieval and, and what that tells us is that we cannot simply use this property in order to get a uniqueness result. Now, <clears throat> that's somehow uh, one way in which proving a uniqueness result, at least to my knowledge, does not work. But um, fortunately, there is also a classical uniqueness result for Gabor phase retrieval. And what it says is that you can recover any square integrable function from the Gabor magnitude, or sorry, from its Gabor magnitude provided that you have access to this Gabor magnitude on the entire time frequency plane R2. Okay, and today we don't want to consider this kind of problem, we want to consider a slightly harder problem where instead of having access to measurements on the entire time frequency plane, we actually have access only on a discrete subset of the time frequency plane. And such a problem we call a sampled Gabor phase retrieval problem. Okay. So now we know why we should care. We know what Gabor phase retrieval is, and we know a little bit about what is classically known um, about uniqueness for Gabor phase retrieval. And I want to now take you into somehow the main part of my talk where I kind of show you what we have been doing for the past few years. And I really split this up into two parts. The first one I call the negative result counterexamples, um, just to tell you what that means. The negative result for me is a situation in which we can pr prove that we cannot do phase retrieval. And the second part I called it some positive results. And a positive result for me is a situation in which we can prove that we can do phase retrieval. So let's start with the negative results. And I, I should say throughout this entire talk, a lot of the results that I'll be showing you are actually joint work with my PhD supervisor, uh, Rima Alefari. 
And I also want to quickly tell you why I care about uh, negative results. Well, the reason is that ultimately I would like to, to prove positive results, of course, but having a negative result for a certain situation tells me and tells other people that um, well, in this kind of situation, we shouldn't expect a positive result. So trying to prove a positive result in this situation is a waste of time. Okay, so that's that's somehow why why we care. Um, now to to explain what we've been doing, I really need to start by explaining a connection between Gabor phase retrieval and the phase retrieval of entire functions first. And this connection comes from a relation between the Gabor transform and what we call the Bargman transform, which is another integral transform. Again, I put that up on the slide. Now, the interesting thing about the Bargman transform is that it takes square integrable signals and it unitarily transforms them to elements of the Fox space, right? Now, I understand, I mean, I, so, so probably it, some people don't know what the Fox space is. And the nice thing here is that you don't need to know because there is essentially one important property of the Fox space that we will be using in more or less all of the rest. We will um, not talk about it today. The one essential property of the Fox space that we will be using is that, and the Fox space is the Hilbert space of entire functions. Okay, so the takeaway message that I want you to have here is that the Bargman transform takes a square integrable signal and transforms it into an entire function. Okay, so let's go on by precisely describing what the relation between the Gabor transform and the Bargman transform is. The relation is uh, here up on the slide, and you can see that the Gabor transform really is just the Bargman transform multiplied by these two factors here and here. And these two factors are really nice um, because they are smooth, but mostly because they are nowhere vanishing. Okay. They, they are never zero. And so what that helps us to show is that the Gabor phase retrieval problem, so the problem of recovering a square integrable signal from uh, the magnitude measurements of its Gabor transform on some uh, subset of time frequency plane omega, is equivalent to the recovery of an entire function from its magnitudes on some subset of the complex plane. And this sub subset omega here of the time frequency plane and the subset omega on the, on the complex plane, they're somehow related by complex conjugation. So if you think of this geometric, uh, yeah, in a geom geometric way, then what you see is that if your omega is this violet colored uh, set here, then um, your omega over bar needs to be the mirror image of this subset by the real number line. Okay. Okay. So now what we what we know is that there's this Gabor phase retrieval problem, and um, it relates to the what what I call the phase retrieval problem of entire functions. Now, what I want to show you next is that this relation is interesting. Right, that there is some things we can do with this relation which are not easy to do when you just look at the Gabor transform. And so to convince you of this fact, I, I, uh, I want to present the following theorem, uh, which says that if you have any open subset of the complex plane, then you can recover an entire function from its magnitudes on that open subset. Okay, now this theorem really has I think an exceptionally nice proof. So I want to show this proof to you. Okay. So the first step in this proof is, I guess, really classical. You take two entire functions and you suppose that their magnitudes agree on your open subset omega. Then you take the fraction of the two entire functions, you call it H. Okay. So let us collect a few, uh, few statements about H. The first one that's maybe pretty obvious, is that H must be holomorphic on C, except for at the roots of G where it's not well-defined, right? It's holomorphic because F and G are holomorphic. It's quite simple. Um, the second thing that we want to notice is that for any root of G that's also in the open set omega, the modulus of H must be one on a sufficiently small neighborhood of that root of G. Okay. And this is interesting because it allows us to use what is known as the Riemann's theorem on removable singularities 
to conclude that A must be a removable singularity, right? And so if we apply this over and over again to every root of G that's also in omega, what we can find is that H actually extends to a holomorphic function on omega. Okay, and, and this somehow is a, that's a very nice situation. Um, well, I'll show you why, because by construction, what we know is that the image of omega under H must be a subset of the unit circle in the complex plane, right? Because the modulus of H is one on omega. Now, any subset, if you think of any subset of the unit circle in the complex plane, uh, then this subset cannot be open. So what we learned from this is that the image uh, of omega under H cannot be open. And then what we may use is this open mapping theorem from complex analysis, which tells us that because H is also holomorphic on omega, H actually must be constant. Okay, now H is constant and it has modulus one. So H must be e to the i alpha. And we, if we unravel this equation for F and G, we, we arrive at something that looks very familiar. We arrive at, at uh, the equation that F must be e to the i alpha G, at least when we're not looking at the roots of G, right? And so now the final step is to realize that omega without the roots of G, that is the set with an accumulation point and F and e to the i alpha G are both entire functions. So we may use the identity theorem from complex analysis to find that F and G must agree up to global phase. Okay. So, so that, that is the proof. And well, I mean, I just uh, want to take the quickly the time to explain why I really like this, um, this theorem and its proof. So there is essentially three reasons for this. Uh, the first one is that the proof is very short. Um, the second one is that while the proof is short, I don't think it's trivial because it combines three interesting insights from complex analysis. And the third reason is that I think that the statement of the theorem is sufficiently interesting. Um, so if I just think of what that means, what this theorem means for Gabor phase retrieval, well, it tells you that if you take any open subset of the time frequency plane, no matter how small that open subset is, um, you can recover any square integrable signal from the Gabor transform magnitude on that open subset. And that is quite a strong uh, statement, I would say. Okay, um, right, I already said that. Okay, now when I, when, I started to, um, when I started to consider this connection between the Gabor transform and the Barkman transform, um, I had a question on my mind. And this question was the following. So the question was, um, is it possible to recover an entire function from its magnitudes on two parallel lines in a complex plane? And so maybe just to quickly explain where this question comes from. So you can already see it here. This is inspired by a paper by Mala and Waldsburger. Um, this paper by Mala and Waldsburger is actually on a Cauchy wavelet phase retrieval. That's a problem that I don't want to discuss today, but it's, um, well, it's a problem that has like certain, uh, has a certain connection to the Gabor phase retrieval problem. And, here in this paper by Mala and Waldsberger, they are able to give a uniqueness result for Cauchy wavelet phase retrieval, which I would have very much liked to generalize to the Gabor or to, to adapt to the Gabor phase retrieval uh, situation. And, and, um, and so in doing so, I kind of stumbled upon this question. Okay. And I guess from this explanation, how I stumbled upon this question, it's already somehow implied that I was strongly believing that the answer to this question should be yes because there is a similar situation for the Cauchy wavelet transform um, where the answer to so, such a question is yes. And uh, I had no clue how to prove this at the time. And so I, I did what, <laughs> what I think a lot of people would do if they had no clue how to prove something that uh, looks reasonably classical, I just Googled it. And um, while Googling, I found a pretty interesting paper by McDonald in which he treats a very similar situation. He treats the, the question of whether you can recover an entire function from its magnitudes on a single line uh, in, in the complex plane. And uh, well, I mean, I think the ideas, or at least one I one specific idea in this paper is, is really nice. And so I just want to show you um, this idea. Okay. Um, 
Well, so I think the easiest way of showing this is by taking the simplest single line I can think of in the complex plane, which is the real number line. And then to take two entire functions, f and g, whose magnitudes agree on the real number line. OK, so what does, what does that tell us? Well, so this is the equation, we're looking, the equation we're looking at. And what happens if we square this equation and realize that the complex conjugate of real number is a real number is that we get this equation. And these two equations are really just equivalent. Now, what's interesting about this equation on the right-hand side is that if we interpret this function here as a function in a complex variable, then this function is an entire function. And the same is true for, for, by the way, for the right-hand side of this equation. And so here um, we have two entire functions which agree on the real number line, and the real number line contains an accumulation point. So we're back at the identity theorem, which tells us that this equation extends to the entire complex plane. So here, what we've done is we've taken an equation which is true for the magnitude of our entire function on a single line, and we modified it in some simple way to get a functional equation on, on the complex plane. Okay, now this might still not be completely transparent. So I want to give you something simpler to remember from this slide, and, and that's simple and important. So, so, okay, so what do I want you to remember? So suppose we have a root of f that's not a root of g, that's what this notation means for me. Um, then what happens in this equation? So the first thing that you'll notice is that if you take f of a, then it must be zero because a is a root of f. So the left-hand side here must be zero, so the right-hand side must be zero. Okay, so far nothing crazy happened. But we also know that a is not a root of g, so we know that g of a is not zero, right? And so by just, well, by just uh, dividing by g of a, we learn that g of the complex conjugate of a must be zero, right? So what we've learned is that the complex conjugate of a must be a root of g. And, um, well, I think, I mean, this is a, I don't know, I mean, it's almost trivial, right? But what, what um, What's interesting, or what 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 is the intuition that I want you to keep from this slide, is that if you have two entire functions whose magnitudes agree on a single line in the complex plane, then there must must be some kind of mirror symmetry in their root sets. And this mirror symmetry, I, I, I don't, I mean, it's not only appealing to me as a mathematician in some sense; it's also uh, quite useful for answering the question that I had about two parallel lines because. If I take, and I'll just illustrate this again on an example, so I take the real number line and a, a, par a parallel line to, to the real number line, and I take a root of f that's not a root of g, then I can use the mirror symmetry that I told you of before um, to see that the complex conjugate uh, of a must be a root of g, right? So this is the mirror symmetry across this line. Now, there's not just a mirror symmetry across this line, I think it's to the surprise of no one, there will also be a mirror symmetry across this line. And if we use this second mirror symmetry on the complex conjugate of A, what we can learn, and this is a bit hand-waving right now, but let me assure you that you can actually make that rigorous, is that there must be another root of F up here, right? And this is just a mirror image of the complex conjugate of A across the upper line. So if you think a little bit about what has happened is, you, you've, you've taken a root of f, you mirrored it twice along two parallel lines. Well, that is, um, that's exactly a translation, right? So what, what has happened is that you started with a root of f and you've learned that a translation by two tau, where here tau is the distance between the two lines, must be another root of f. Okay, and this kind of argument does not, of course, not only work for this specific root of f, it works for any root of f. So in particular, it works for this root of f up here. So you can translate it up again, you find another root of f, and again and again. And in this way, you find infinitely many roots of f that are not roots of g in the upper half plane, and the same can be said for the lower half plane. So the take home message of this is that if you have two entire functions whose magnitude, magnitudes agree on two parallel lines, then there must be some kind of translation symmetry in the root sets. And this translation symmetry is, uh, or this idea is powerful enough to combine it with certain results from complex analysis in order to, um, 
well, to give a characterization and to give a characterization of a situation in which we have any two parallel lines in the complex plane and a fun com uh, sorry, an entire function f, and you try to characterize all entire functions g whose magnitudes agree with those of f on those two parallel lines. Right, so you just use the ideas from before and you use some results from complex analysis. Now, the full characterization that we're able to give, it's up on the archive since, I don't know, a few months, is, um, is pretty technical. So instead of showing you this full characterization, I just rather um, show you one instance of this characterization, uh, which is the following. So these two functions were generated by using this uh, characterization. and what, well, you can see what they are, but what's interesting about these two functions is that they do not agree up to global phase. You can see this by, uh, by look, considering their root sets and seeing that their root sets are actually different. And at the same time, their magnitudes agree on two parallel lines, uh, well, which are distance one apart. And yeah, so you can either directly compute this or you can use the full characterization here to show this. Okay. And what, what this example does is it, it answers the question that I had before, because it tells us that it's impossible to recover an entire function from magnitude measurements on just two parallel lines. Okay. And so this, at the time, this was certainly bad news for me because I was hoping that it would be possible to, to get a new uniqueness result for Gabor phase retrieval, but actually, um, well, in the long run, it, it's turned out to be quite interesting um, because of the, thing that I'll show you on the following slide, which, um, which is just another intuition that I want to, um, want to give you, is that if you start adding more and more lines, and all of these lines have the same distance apart as, as the first two lines, then you're not really introducing any more symmetries into the picture. So infinitely many equidistant parallel lines come with somehow similar symmetries as two parallel lines. OK, so why is that true? Um, if you look at two parallel lines, like we've done before, and you have a root of f here, then like we've said before, there must be another root of f, which is just a translation by parameter two tau up uh, in this case, right? So what happens if we add another parallel line at the same distance apart? Well, we can, we can try to understand what, or I mean, we already do understand what symmetries are uh, somehow generated by the lowest uh, line here and, and the highest line. Because those symmetries, again, are translation symmetries. And here, because the lines have distance to tau, the translations that, that the somehow generates are translations by four tau, right? Now, translations by four tau are somehow not unheard of in, in the symmetries generated by these two parallel lines, so the one in the middle and the one on the bottom, because the translation by four tau is just translating twice by two tau. Right, So we already knew that we would be having this root of f that's not a root of g, just from knowing that we have this root of f and knowing that the magnitudes of f and g agree on the middle parallel line and the parallel line on the bottom. So adding in the information that the magnitudes of f and g agree on this additional parallel line hasn't told us anything new about the roots. OK. And so in the end, right, if you have these three parallel lines, you still have some of the same or similar translation symmetries. And what you can also do is you can add more and more parallel lines, all of which have the same distance apart, and you're not getting new symmetries. OK. And so this is somehow the picture. Um, and just to give you the example as well, well, if you use the same functions like we had before, then what you can show by direct computation is that their magnitudes agree on infinitely many parallel lines in the complex plane. Okay, and this is not just some kind of isolated uh, situation because in fact what we're able to do is, um, is give a full char characterization of all entire function whose magnitudes agree on infinitely many parallel lines in, in the time frequency plane. And then the eagle eyed <laughs> of you will spot that here there is like this exponential type assumption, which is really just an assumption we used in order to make the results less technical. So you can have a similar result if you um, take uh, any finite order entire functions. 
Okay. So so that is the work on entire function. So what but somehow what I want to get to now is is what does this imply for sample cabosis, if you want? And and so that's what I'll do here. And before I do that, just let me quickly remind you: sample cabor phase retrieval is the problem of recovering a square integrable signal, let's say in some signal class X, from the magnitude of its cabor transform on some discrete subset of the time frequency plane. And um, well, before I before I uh, answer this question, I want to state or emphasize that for um, well, if, if we're looking at the full space L2, if that is our signal class, then for a long, long time, people believe that this, um, that this question should have a positive answer so that there should be some A that is sufficiently small such that we can recover all square integrable signals from the Gabor transform magnitudes on a quadratic lattice with parameter A. And maybe just to quickly explain why you could believe such a thing. Well, if you think of this, um, let's say in term, like if you think of the Gabor frame problem, so if you think of the problem, can you recover a square integrable signal from its Gabor transform? And here there's no magnitude, okay? So can you recover just from its Gabor transform on a quadratic lattice? Um, then the answer is yes, provided that your lattice parameter A is smaller than one. Right? This is a famous theorem in, in the theory of Gabor frames. And so the hope in the phase retrieval community was that if you would just make A small enough, so if you, in other words, would make your data redundant enough, um, then you could have a positive result, Gabor phase retrieval. Okay. And now, so uh, to well, to, to link back to, to these entire functions, I think maybe some of you can already see that uh, if you know all of these things about entire functions, you can more or less directly say that the answer to this question is no. So it's not possible to recover. Well, at least if you put, or well, if you take L2 as your signal space, of course, uh, to recover any L2 function from these kind of measure, uh, measurements. Why? Because if you take um, the inverse Barkman transform, of the two functions that I showed you just before. So you take them and you translate them to L2 functions. Then the L2 functions that you get are these, up to making them look a little bit nicer, uh, let's say up to cosmetic differences, um, are these, okay? These are, you can see them here, I plotted them. These are real valued, strongly decaying functions. And what, what you can see, because actually they have different root sets again, and they do not agree up to global phase. And at the same time, because of the relation between the Barkman transform and the Gabor transform, um, their magnitudes agree on infinitely many parallel lines in the time frequency plane. So what these counterexamples show is that no matter what lattice you take, at least if it's an axis aligned uh, lattice, then you cannot recover uh, all square integrable signals from Gabor transform magnitudes on that lattice. And so this is somehow not the end of the story because we can slightly generalize um, our results. Not only, we, not only can we take lines that are parallel to the real number line, but we can also uh, take, let's say, any set of parallel lines in the time frequency plane and show that there exist two square integral functions which do not agree up to global phase, but whose Gabor magnitudes agree on this set of infinitely many parallel lines. Okay. And so what that means for lattices or for, for the sampled Gabor phase retrieval uh, problem is that no matter what lattice you choose in the time frequency plane, you can never get the, I mean, you can never recover all the square integrable signals from Gabor magnitude measurements on that lattice. Okay. So that is that's the negative result we have that that actually, as a side remark, has been later um, adapted to the short time Fourier transform case. Um, so that, that means adapted to the case where you have more general window functions um, by Gross and Lia. But uh, yeah, so that's all kind of all we have on, on the negative side. So uh, let me, for the second part of this talk, let me turn to the positive side of things. And the first thing that's somehow clear when you, when you think of this is that um, because for L2, we can show that it's impossible to have uh, a uniqueness result in sampled Gabor phase retrieval, we have to restrict the signal class. 
And uh, so the most, for me, the most natural candidate of the signal class is uh, the Paley Wiener space of band limited functions, whose definition I, I put here. And really the reason for why I think that this is, uh, that this is the most natural signal, the class is because inside of this Paley Wiener space of band limited functions there, is something called the Shannon sampling theorem, which guarantees that we can recover band limited functions from samples. And these samples are taking at a fixed rate, which we call the Nyquist rate. Okay, so these are equidistant samples taken at a fixed rate. Okay. And so, okay, so not only is there this Shannon sampling theorem in the Paley Wiener space, but actually with, with some effort, we can, um, we can prove that real valued elements of the Paley Wiener space can be uniquely recovered up to global sign from sample Gabor measurements. Okay. And here, so this kind of problem, and we call this a sign retrieval problem because, um, well, if your function is real valued, you're not trying to assign a global phase, let's say, uh, to it. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you're not trying to assign phases to every single point, but you're trying to as assign signs because we're, it's, it's real valued. Okay. So that's why we call this a sign retrieval problem to somehow distinguish between these easier problems where our data is real valued, and, uh, sorry, where our signals are real valued and the harder problem where our um, signals are complex valued. Okay, so let me show you what we can prove. So what we can prove is that um, if we have a real valued function that's band limited, then we can recover it from uh, its Gabor transform magnitude on, uh, well, on a discrete subset of the time frequency plane. And this discrete subset consists of sampling at twice the Nyquist rates in time and uh, just taking a single frequency pin. Okay. So let me show you, because the proof of this result is not too hard to follow. So let me show you uh, how we prove this. Um, the first thing that, that we should do is maybe quickly just introduce some notation. So this phi here, I'll just denote the, the Gaussian by phi. And with this notation, what we can see is that the Gabor transform at frequency zero is just a convolution against the Gaussian kernel. Okay. And so this is interesting because it allows us to understand in, that this function is in a Paley Wiener space. And the way to understand this is that if you take the Fourier transform of the Gabor transform at frequency zero, well, then that's just convolution against the Gaussian kernel. So the Fourier convolution theorem will tell you that you get the Fourier transform of F multiplied with the Fourier transform of phi. And phi is the Gaussian and the Fourier transform of the Gaussian is the Gaussian. So you get the Fourier transform of F multiplied with the Gaussian. Okay, now we had assumed that, that F was in the paley wiener space. So the Fourier transform of F, um, well, it's just an L2 function that's compactly supported. And the Gaussian, you can see it here, is an L, is a function that's an L infinity. So the multiplication of these two things is again, an L2 function that is compactly supported. And what we learned from this rather lengthy argument with a lot of words is that um, the Gabor transform at frequency zero is in the Paley-Wiener space. And then if you think about this for a while, both of these functions are real valued. So this must be real valued as well. Okay, and this is now a very nice situation that we move ourselves into, um, where we know that the function that we're looking at is real valued and in the Paley Wiener space, and we know it's well samples of its magnitude at twice the Nyquist rate. Um, okay, so so why is that a nice situation? Because there is a result by Gaurav Takwa from 2010, in which he shows that. Well, knowing a real valued pay function in the Paley Wiener space, well, knowing its magnitude at twice the Nyquist rate is enough to know that function up to global sign. Okay. And once we found this convolution up to global sign, what we can do, of course, is deconvolution because phi is a Gaussian. And then we know f up to global sign. And that proves um, the theorem. Okay, now let me make two quick remarks on this uh, on this theorem. The first one is that, um, well, this kind of argument is somehow not very specific to the Gaussian. So we can generalize it to some extent to other window functions. Uh, the second remark is that, again, also this argument is somehow not very, so we don't really need to use this equidistant sampling set that we've been looking at. We can also work with more general sampling sets. So this, I guess, two fairly simple 
uh, generalizations of this result that uh, we can somehow directly see from the proof. Um, a third generalization of this result, which is less easy and much more interesting, is uh, somehow, uh, well, is asked by the following question, which is what happens for complex valued signals? So can we derive a uniqueness result for full sample of Gabor phase retrieval? And um, well, one thing that I think is uh, maybe not so hard to see, and I will show you on this slide, is that for the sampling in time, we can use Shannon sampling theorem. Now, the reason for this is that if we have an element of the paid arena space, then for any fixed frequency, it is true that the Gabor magnitude squared of that element of the paid wiener space is again in the paid wiener space. And the only difference that we're having here is that we have to uh, increase the bandwidth by a factor two, okay? And so what this tells us is that we can use Shannon sampling theorem directly uh, in order to recover the magnitude squared of our Gabor transform of the element of the paid wiener space at any time for a fixed frequency from knowing um, information on just twice the Nyquist rate in time, right? That's kind of what we've seen. This kind of sampling regime is kind of what we've seen in the, in the theorem before. So in time, we can use Shannon sampling theorem. Now the hard, or the, to me, harder question is what, what to do about frequency. And um, well, this question was, uh, was answered by two researchers from Vienna, Philip Kroos and Lukas Lia. And what they were able to show is, is like the following very nice uniqueness results in uh, phase retrieval. Um, so what that is, is that if you have an element of the Paley-Wiener space, and here maybe an interesting detail is that um, you have the integrability condition four instead of integrability condition two. Um, so if you have such an element of the Paley-Wiener space, then you can recover it up to global phase from its Gabor transform magnitude on a rectangular lattice. And this re rectangular lattice, as you can see, you take twice the Nyquist rate in time and you take just infinitely many frequencies uh, in frequency. Okay. And now uh, I just quickly want to show you what the main ideas in this proof are. Well, I guess the main idea for, for uh, sampling in time is um, was given by Shannon sampling theorem and, and so by the slides that I showed you before. And if, if you use this in this situation, what you can learn is that just knowledge at twice the Nyquist rate in time here is enough to infer knowledge about, about infinitely many parallel lines in the time frequency plane, right? And now if you're kind of, uh, if you're like me and you've done or you thought about all this work with the entire functions and infinitely many parallel lines, you'll think, okay, so now we utilize this connection to complex analysis. But that, that is actually not what Philip Kohls and Lucas Lear have done. Uh, what they've done instead is, um, They've taken the Fourier transform of this equation and they showed that that well that just amounts to this equation that you have on your slide now okay and the equation you have on your slide now is slightly complicated so I want to to pick it apart um, kind of term by term and the first term I want to you to have a look at is, is this term here in red and this term here in red if you think about it these are just translates of the Gauss Okay, and there is a well, there is a theorem due to Zalik from 1978, which tells you that these translates of Gaussians are actually complete in the compactly supported functions in L2. Okay, okay, and that so this is really interesting because if we go back to uh, the term that we have up here, then because this f is in the Paley-Wiener space with integrability condition four, its Fourier transform is in L4. So here we're looking at the multiplication of two elements of L4. So that's an L2 function, right? So what we're looking at here is really just an inner product in L2. And here we have an L2 function, here we have an L2 function. And this inner product is zero. So what it tells us is that this L2 function here is orthogonal to all the translates of the Gaussian, which form a complete set in L2, okay? And so therefore you learn that this, L2 function is zero, right? And so that can be re reformulated in this way. And then you just take some Fourier transforms, do some technical calculations to show that F and G must agree up to global phase. Okay. Now let me also make a quick remark on generalization of this uh, result. Well, 
one thing that that struck me as a bit artificial here is that um, while well, you take this Paleo-Venus space with indicability condition four, normally, I don't know, I think to me, this is the more natural space. So I was wondering whether that's just a technical requirement or whether that's actually some kind of deeper fundamental problem. Turns out that it's not a deeper fundamental problem and that you can just prove the same results when you replace four by two. And the thing about it is though, that it's just really technical. And one way of seeing this is by saying, okay, F is in a Paleoena space with integrability condition two. So it's Fourier transform is an L2. So this multiplication here is an L1. And now you don't have this orthogonality relations that you had before. And well, you need to come up with some other arguments um, to do the same thing. Okay. Okay, so now let me take you to the final part of this talk. And in this final part, I want to introduce quickly introduce a new problem that we haven't seen before. So if you if you've lost me at this point, this is a good chance to <laughs> to uh, come back in and uh, listen to the final five minutes. Um, so the problem that I that I want to quickly consider here is what we call the finite dimensional phase retrieval problem, okay? And so that problem is the problem of recovering a complex vector from, again, magnitude measurements. And what we see here is the inner product of this complex vector x with some phi m, which we call measurement vectors, and they are also complex vectors, okay? Now, one famous question in connection with this uh, with this finite dimensional phase retrieval problem is the following, uh, asked by Bandera, Cahill, uh, Mixon, and Nelson in 2014. So the question is, suppose you have some fixed dimension L, then what is the smallest number of measurements M star L for which this kind of finite dimensional phase retrieval problem actually enjoys uniqueness? And interestingly, if you think of the sign retrieval setting, so just to recapitulate, the sign retrieval setting is the setting in which you don't have complex vectors, but you have real vectors here and here. The answer to this question is, has been known since 2006. And it was given by Balan, Kazatsa, and Ididin. And what they show is that M star L needs to be 2L minus one, right? So I think this is somehow, um, the core of a certain intuition that, or one of the most repeated intuitions in phase retrieval, uh, at least one of the things I've heard most often in the past few years is that a two-fold redundancy is necessary and sufficient for uniqueness in sign retrievability, in sign retrieval, right? So that's somehow an intuition that is around in the community. And interestingly, if we, if we bring, this, uh, bring this back to the Gabor phase retrieval problem, this intuition seems to be not only correct for the finite dimensional phase retrieval problem, but also correct for the Gabor phase retrieval problem because, well, the theorem essentially verifies this. You, what it says is that if you have a real valued element of your paleo inner space, then you can recover it up to global sign from its Gabor transform magnitude on a certain sampling set where you take twice the Nyquist rate in time and you take a single frequency and twice the Nyquist rate in time in a single frequency that exactly corresponds to a two-fold redundancy in your measurements. So what is true is that a two-fold redundancy in your measurements is sufficient for uniqueness in Gabor sign retrieval. Okay. And then what we may do is we may ask if so, okay, what about phase retrieval? Well, phase retrieval is slightly more complicated. Um, in phase retrieval, what, what one can show is that M star L needs to be on the order of 4L. And this somehow gives rise to this intuition that, that is around that a fourfold redundancy is necessary and sufficient for uniqueness in phase retrieval. And now a pretty natural question that I was asked by Afonso Pandera when I gave a similar talk about half a year ago um, is, so what about, uh, what about Gabor phase retrieval? Is, is it true that a fourfold redundancy somehow is also sufficient there? And I, well, we thought about this for a while and what we can show is the following. Um, if you take any two frequencies, the only thing that's important about these two frequencies is that they are different. Then you can recover an element of your Paleo-Wiener space just from knowing its magnitude on, well, a sampling set. And this sampling set here, you take twice uh, the Nyquist rate in time and you take two frequencies. And so twice the Nyquist rate in time and two frequencies, that, that's exactly a fourfold redundancy in your measurements. And so what is true is that 
fourfold redundancy in your measurements is sufficient for uniqueness in sampled Gabor phase retrieval. Okay, so that is all I wanted to tell you. Now I just uh, want to show you all of the amazing papers that, <laughs> or like some are, uh, well, all of the papers that I used to, uh, to make this talk, I'll go through them pretty quickly. And if you're interested in any of these papers, then please have a look at the YouTube recording of this talk and, and press pause and then you can, uh, you can find the paper easily. Thank you very much um, again to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me and thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. All right, before we ask our questions, let's hit that reaction button. Thank Matthias for a great talk. Uh, and Dustin, you can.